Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks again for coming, and thanks to all of our special guests for coming to present. Uh, tonight, we have three uh, different presenters, uh, two from Call Plus, which is a very proud program sponsor of our peer program for many years. We work with Call Plus on many different projects, and, and they're strong supporters of the work that we do. And so we're very happy to present this session with them today. And we also have uh, a nurse from our uh, Fraser Health region here. And so I will now introduce them properly with their real titles. Cue the notes. Uh, we have uh, Shelby Payton, who is our, who's the consumer care supervisor with Call Plus. So if you um, contact the Call Plus care program, you're going to be talking with Shelby and her team. We also have Robin Frost, who is our, uh, the continence care manager with Coloplast. And um, Robin helps us out with lots of different things uh, related to our, our partnership and is a really good source of knowledge. I'll also just flag Christian Prescott and Chris O'Neill, who are also joining us from Coloplast. Um, some of you might have come across these guys. Um, Christian in particular, if you guys have any questions about Coloplast products or you wanna try them, Christian is your guy. Um, I didn't mean for this to become a call blast commercial, but here we are. Um, <laughs> here we are. <laughs> um, and then finally, I'd like to introduce uh, Marsha Carr. So Marsha has many titles, so I'm going to get it right. She's a clinical nurse specialist and a nurse continence advisor. So needless to say, she knows her stuff and she's here to tell us um, some of, of what she knows about these new guidelines that have come out. And so... Um, just one more housekeeping note before we get started. If you guys have questions, and I hope you do, please put them in the chat and we'll monitor the questions throughout. And uh, if it seems like it's a good time to interrupt our presenters, we will. Otherwise, we'll definitely have time at the end for a Q&A period. So um, with that, I will pass it over to our presenters. Hi. Thanks, Shelley. Thanks for the intro and thank you to everybody here at SCIBC for having us here tonight. Uh, I am going to share my screen so you don't have to look at my face the whole time. Uh, so welcome everybody. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, we have um, a pretty packed hour for you here. Um, so we're going to start off by talking about clinical best practice recommendations and what they are and why they're important. Uh, we're going to tell you about the new Canadian best practice recommendations for catheters. Uh, we're going to get an overview, a deeper overview of uh, specifically the Canadian nursing best practice recommendations. Uh, we have five tips for advocacy that we're going to, or self-advocacy, uh, that we're going to share with you. And finally, we're going to uh, finish it off by talking about reimbursement and funding for intermittent catheters, uh, specifically in BC, uh, also uh, within Canada as well. Uh, so Shelly was already kind enough to do the speaker introduction. So my name's Robin. I'm the Continence Care Market Manager for Canada. I'll be kicking things off here for a few slides and then I will hand it over to our um, special guest, Marsha Carr, who we're really excited to have here with us tonight. And finally, Shelby is going to finish things off for us. So let's start briefly by talking about best practice recommendations and why they're important. Um, so clinical practice guidelines or recommendations are statements that include recommendations intended to assist medical professionals in providing appropriate health care in certain clinical scenarios. Now that's a very clinical and formal kind of definition, um, but what it essentially boils down to is that clinical practice guidelines uh, are uh, intended to assist a healthcare professional looking at a specific patient in a specific situation and helping them assess what the best course of treatment or healthcare is for that patient. Um, it's really important to note that best practice recommendations or clinical practice recommendations are based on science. Um, and they are uh, based on a systematic review of evidence, which means that all of the relevant evidence about whatever subject in this case, catheter use, uh, was collected and was analyzed and reviewed by the team that put these documents together. Uh, and then that analysis is incorporated into the recommendations. So the recommendations are not just based on the, the practices of you know, one specific hospital, one specific health region. Uh, they're not based on things like funding or um, uh, you know, cost efficiencies or stuff like that. They're based on scientific evidence and clinical evidence. 
Um, and really importantly, best practice guidelines can help um, influence and sometimes even change the standard of care. Um, so speaking of standard of care, let's talk a little bit about where we're coming from uh, within Canada and within BC, because Can Canadian catheter users, they face a lot of challenges and a lot of challenges that are unique to the Canadian uh, landscape. So up until 2020, Canada was actually one of only two developed nations that recommended catheter reuse. There were no um, national best practice guidelines in place. And without these best practice guidelines in place, uh, this perpetuated a lack of funding for catheters because public funders saw that, you know, uh, healthcare professionals were recommending their patients reuse catheters. So if healthcare professionals are recommending that, why would they need to pay for single use catheters? So there was no funding in place. And then of course, this lack of funding perpetuates um, uh, widespread reuse of catheters across the country. And we know that reuse presents uh, a lot of additional burdens and challenges to catheter users. So in many ways, uh, Canadian IC users or catheter users have not been set up for success with their treatment. Um, I mentioned the, the potential downfalls or, or risks of reuse, uh, and they are there are plenty, certainly, um, uh, starting, I guess, with the fact that the simple fact that reuse is cumbersome and it's inconvenient and it's time consuming. And the time it takes to use a catheter and then wash it and sanitize it and air dry it and store it, you know, appropriately, um, and then repeat that cycle every time you catheterize can add up. And it certainly is significant when it's compared to single use where you're just able to open your catheter, perform your catheterization, dispose of the catheter in your garbage and kind of go about your day. Um, it adds minutes to the routine and minutes, you know, add up over a day, over a week, over a month, uh, and over a lifetime, certainly. Um, so because of this, or in part because of this, at least, uh, many catheter users will start to compromise on those healthy habits because they're they don't want to deal with that cumbersome process. Um, and they'll avoid cathing for, you know, a little bit longer and a little bit longer. So they'll do things like um, reduce fluid intake. So you don't need to catheterize as often, but this of course is not great for the body overall. Um, or, you know, we'll push the catheterizing catheterization schedule a little bit further. So instead of every two to three hours, maybe it's every three to four hours. And especially when catheter users are out of the house. This is frequently when we run into those issues um, because nobody wants to go through the, the process of reusing and washing a catheter when you're not in the, the safety and the, the hygiene of your own home. Um, so all of this um, compromising on these habits leads to, in many cases, residual urine sitting in the bladder for longer than it should. And having that urine sitting in your bladder uh, can lead to longer term um, decreased quality of uh, bladder health. And then finally, we know that there are a couple of studies that suggest that users who have to reuse their catheter or who put in a reuse position wind up being less compliant to their treatment. So that's to say that they won't catheterize as per their healthcare professional's advice or recommendations. So they'll push that catheterization, that period between catheterizations a little bit longer and they won't catheterize as often necessarily, or quite frequently, uh, catheter users who are in a reuse situation will just drop off of intermittent catheterization altogether. And intermittent catheterization is globally recognized as the gold standard for treatment, but users will move away to an indwelling situation or a suprapubic situation, which can carry its own impacts to, to health and to lifestyle as well. So happily, in 2020, last year, uh, in spring and summer, there were two new Canadian best practice recommendations published for catheter use. So the first, uh, clean intermittent urethral catheterization in adults, uh, is a Canadian best practice recommendation for nurses. And importantly, this document was created by um, four groups of nurses coming together. So nurses specializing in wound ostomy and continence, Canadian nurse continence advisors, urology nurses of Canada, and infection prevention and control. So all of the nursing groups that really had a hand and really specialize and deal with um, uh, or support catheter patients or patients who use catheters um, came together to collaborate on this document. And then the second document, the Canadian Urological Association Best Practice Report on Catheter Use, um, is a bit of a briefer document. 
and it was published in July and comes, of course, from the Urologists of Canada. Um, so these documents are both, uh, they're both clinical, absolutely, and they're intended for healthcare professionals. Um, the nursing document in particular is quite hefty. It's a good 65 or 67 pages, I think. Um, but they contain a lot of great information and both are publicly uh, available to the public, to anybody who wants to read them. So certainly we're happy to share those, those links with you if you like. Um, the really important piece about these best practice recommendations, other than the fact that they finally exist and we finally have something from national bodies in Canada, is that they really take um, a holistic view of the patient, which means that they're not just considering the patient as a person with a medical issue that requires treatment within the four walls of a clinic or, or a doctor's office. The, they consider the patient as a person who is going to leave that office and have a life outside of there and who has a family and perhaps a job and maybe likes to travel and is needs to be able to incorporate this treatment or whatever their treatment plan is into their full lifestyle. Um, and with that, I think that I will hand things over to Marsha Carr. She is going to give us a bit more of a detailed overview of the nursing best practice recommendations, which she had a hand in developing. So Marsha. Thanks so much, Robin. And so um, thanks everybody for coming on and um, allowing me to be able to provide you with some information related to the nursing best practice. But ultimately, when we talk about nursing, we are talking about how do we do the best care for all of our patients, clients, and residents that may be utilizing intermittent catheterizations. Next, please. Um, I do need to declare a conflict of inter, uh, interest declaration in that I um, do do work and receive honoraria from Coloplast as well as SD Canada. And I do a lot of presentations to healthcare professionals and nurses and also to the public related to assessment and conservative management of urinary and fecal incontinence and inconstant incontinence associated dermatitis, as well as um, I do, uh, I did contribute to the best practice uh, recommendations for nurses, and uh, that Coloplast did assist us with some of the funding in order to do that work. Um, and also, I am a director of the Nikkei uh, Seniors Healthcare and Housing Society, uh, and the Council of um, our and nurse practitioners of BC, nurse, I'm um, on the Canadian Nurse Conference Advisor uh, Executive and the BC Clinical Nurse Specialist, and I'm also uh, on the Clinical Nurse Specialist of Canada. So I do a lot of volunteer work as well, including de-prescribing. Next, please. So what is this all about? Clean intermittent urethral catheterization in adults, the best practice. Um, it was, as Robin said, we did come together as four major uh, groups that have expertise in uh, the care of individuals requiring intermittent catheterization, whether it be uh, self-catheterization or other colleagues um, doing the catheterization or support networks such as families and informal caregivers. But we needed to be able to be very clear about what we found in the literature, as well as coming together for a full robust discussion around how best we can support our recommendations and also look at coming together about messaging so that we are consistent about that. Next, please. Um, so in terms of statements regarding catheters, I think it is really important to know that some catheters are manufactured for multiple use while others are man manufactured for single use. Um, and so, however, when they're licensed in Canada, when Health Canada licenses, licenses these companies, it must state very clearly whether it is a single use or multiple use and um, the disposal afterwards. The single use catheters are not designed 
to be reused. And it is strictly against the original equipment manufacturer's instructions and therefore really against what Health Canada is expecting the practitioners to relate to the end users. So the reuse of single catheters is a contentious involving subject primarily due to um, cost implications for the uh, end users. So that's why we came together and that's why we really need to be very clear on what we are recommending. Next, please. You may already know the potential complications of intermittent uh, catheterization. And this is what we kept as first and foremost in our mind when we were doing this review. And that was the whole issue around false, creating false passages, um, urethral bleeding, urethral strictures, needle stenosis, bladder perforation, catheter nodding, bladder calculus, and overall pain and discomfort. Um, when we looked at these as well, it all impacts quality of life. And as I will bring up later, we really needed to consider the full impact on quality of life. Next, please. So I'm, although we have quite a few chapters, I really wanted to select those that were most relevant to you. And so the three, uh, chapter three was about infection prevention and control. Our recommendation has been single use pre-lubricated catheters should be the first and foremost recommendation. In a patient performing IC, by the same token, only symptomatic UTI should be treated. And the primary reason for this is that um, following antibiotic stewardship in only treating the symptom symptomatic UTIs, as opposed to um, the bladder normally does create some bacteria, which is, uh, does not cause the symptoms. We do not treat that with antibiotics because we do not want the ongoing um, antibiotic resistance so that it becomes untreatable. And overall, the best prevention <laughs> as our dear, uh, person out here is saying, and that is hand hygiene. Um, so, so this applies not just to COVID, but also to the um, intermittent catheterization. And it's the number one is hand hygiene, as well as good genital hygiene, especially before catheter insertion. And this actually can be done with um, warm water and just spraying to make sure that things are clean. The use of soap and water is not necessary all the time. It is though necessary to make sure that you flush the area, um, the meatal area that you're going to be inserting into. Next please. So as I mentioned before, patient quality of life was really very, very important. And we did a lot in terms of looking at the literature as well as telling about our uh, own personal experiences with patients, clients, and uh, families. So the positive is that we can improve urinary symptoms. And um, if, if uh, things are done well, um, unbroken sleep, independence, more self-confidence, and truly a normal sexual life. The negative, though, is, as you well know, the difficulty to incorporate into the daily life with the lack of public washrooms being uh, set up in order to facilitate a safe and private way in order for self-catheterization to occur does present an issue, it can be painful, and it is tiring and time consuming. And we really do see that. And that's why it was extremely important for us to keep that first and foremost in our mind when we were making our recommendations, but also in assisting our clients and our patients to be able to uh, adapt and look at ways that they could adapt to 
their own personal lives and their lifestyles, intermittent catheterization. Next, please. So there are in uh, chapter five, the various different types of catheter material and types. And um, Shelby will be going over some of this at the end. However, I just wanted to just say that there's the uncoated catheters for both males and females and that do require ster sterile lubrication. And sterile lubrication is extremely important to emphasize here in that um, the bladder is a sterile cavity. Urine is sterile while it is in your bladder. And so um, the fact is that we do not want to introduce any bacteria into the bladder at all. Uh, however, uncoated catheters, sometimes it can be quite messy just trying to uh, apply the sterile lubrication, let alone uh, handle it. Then we get into the hydrophilics, which were an absolute uh, scientific and technological godsend to all of us that um, utilize catheters. Um, and these have gel on the catheter or wrapping, or you just have to wet the solution. Uh, underwater in order to activate the actual gel formation and the lubricant. So we've got them coming in regular catheter lengths, compact catheter lengths, both for male and female. And the final one, the closed catheter system is extremely helpful, especially if you need to uh, catheterize in um, a public area such as a public washroom. Um, and this way, you it, it is much, much simpler to use. Next, please. The catheter materials do vary as well. And um, these are, are the coloplast ones. So they do have uncoated catheters as well as the hydrophilics. And um, so these are the various types where you've got the standard length catheters and then the compact one. And then finally the closed system where you just, you'll see the little bag there at the very top in which you will um, just be able to advance the catheter through that uh, bag and insert and it catches everything. And then you dispose of it, uh, of course, in uh, the best way possible. So those are just a few things that we are also, we reviewed a lot of catheters, a lot of materials, and um, tried to bring it down to what um, were the most commonly used within Canada. Next, please. So chapter seven was about patient education. And to some extent, it was about how we as nurses can assist you in advocating for yourself as well in the ability to access um, at a reasonable um, cost to, to yourselves um, in terms of single-use catheters. We do review ways to teach and things like that, but it is, um, it was very important for us to also be very person-centered to ensure that the uh, when we're talking to anybody, especially individuals that were initially starting to use intermittent catheterization, that we get an idea about their beliefs, how they feel about intermittent catheterization, uh, what they value, but to get their stories. and. Every time when we are contacting or with our clients, that we allow that time to hear how the IC is affecting their life and uh, what they see the issues are, as opposed to us saying, you must, you must, you must. We need to start using um, more about a coaching and a listening approach and then looking for um a collaborative way in which we can together advocate and get the best uh, approach for you. So uh, next please. The whole issue about reuse or single use, 
This was debated over and over and over again within our groups as well um, when we were writing this, these guidelines um, because over and over again, it came out about whether or not um, the cost should, should the cost uh, of them should trump the actual best practice. And we ultimately came down to the fact that it is patient's choice as to what it is, but we do have a role in providing the information, the evidence-based information that single use only is the best practice. And um, despite the fact that cost is a major contributing and oftentimes, oftentimes the decision-making factor in what the patient actually will choose, um, we did include um, what we had gleaned as the best practice for reuse. However, in saying that, we still needed to emphasize that it was important that we uh, promote single use and then dispose and follow the manufacturer's recommendations. So the next, please. This is about how you may be able to advocate for yourself and collaborate with your healthcare provider, whether it's the nurse, the urologist, or whomever is um, the support person that you have. So there are a number of ways that you may be able to do this. And it is important that you complete any required forms and provide any requested documentation. If possible, discuss a trial period with your doc as well. And we do have access to samples and this is um, extremely important so that you can try things out and see what may be the best for you. And it becomes more of a discussion and a working with as a opposed to being told what you need to do. It is your body, it is what you are feeling, and we as the healthcare providers need to be able to hear, listen, and guide as best we can and work with you, not just tell you what you need to do. And so in the um, best practice guidelines, they were, they have been designed to be able to both from um, the urology uh, physicians, as well as the nurses, we are quite willing to share the recommendations and the guidelines and the evidence to say, these are, this is what the research is saying. This is what needs to be done. Um, you can also, especially when, if you're talking to uh, funders, as well as to government is the storytelling, the very personal storytelling has a huge impact on the recipient of the message that you're trying to get through. And to ask them to please take the time to hear your full story and the impact on yourself. And I certainly can tell you a, a quick story about how I had um, a certain type of intermittent catheter removed from our health authority in Fraser Health because it did not have polished tips on it. And when I brought it to the, um, the group and described what would happen, they were appalled that we even had that on the shelves of the health authority so that they were removed immediately as being dangerous and they were re uh, replaced with uh, polished uh, tips for sure. So it is, it was about the storytelling that often will send the best message and the quality in, on your life and the impact on that. Next, please. So if there is one thing I'd like to say to you, the key to change is believing it is achievable. 
And the greater the collective voice, the greater it is heard. So we certainly within the nursing community have been advocating and being quite vocal about the importance to follow what the manufacturers have and Health Canada when they had uh, approved the, the catheters that they are single use, that they should be single use. We also all need to talk about the success that sets the path to further change, engagement and successes, positive outcomes, baby, baby steps. Don't give up. We don't give up. We just keep taking baby steps. Sometimes we get pushed back a huge step, but we continue on to take those baby steps. So we're here to support you in your journey of um, your life journey of quality of life and to support you in doing what is best for you. Thanks. Any questions that so far? All right, so I'll polish a little, pass it over to Shelby then. We did have a couple of questions, okay. Marsha. Okay. Uh, that came through on the chat while you were speaking. Um, Richard asked if the use of catheter past the best before date would be recommended or not. It, okay, no. <laughs> um, we, we honestly have to follow the manufacturer's recommendation that the, and if it's, if it's past the, the uh, expiry date, then unfortunately, you may be able to go back to where you purchased them from or to the manufacturer of that catheter to have them replaced. Um, because you may have bought a huge amount and, and you just were not using them as frequently. So that is another way that you may be able to um, look for some assistance instead of just um, throwing them out, disposing of them. And uh, there's another question. If you would recommend the use of antibacterial wipes in the genital area for cleaning. Uh, no, um, we are not recommending um, the use of those, especially because what it does is um, it affects the tissue, it dries the tissue out, and we want the moisture of that tissue to maintain so that there is not any type of dermatitis or yeast infections and things like that, strictly from um, the friction and the, the toxicity of the chemicals themselves. Although in um, when we are catheterized, sterilize, sterilizing uh, or doing sterile technique in uh, hospital settings, we do use um, chlorhexidine, for example, as the recommended um, um, product in order to clean the area but that's because we're using it within a healthcare setting that may have multiple organisms floating around and there are other individuals that are acutely ill or ill in the setting. And so we must always move towards sterile uh, approach. However, in the home, um, it is plain water is and just cleaning well once a day with soap and water and then after that, strictly with water is fine. Tap water is fine. Our tap water is good tap water. Um, thank you for that. Um, we have a question from Jeff Gertrell. He's uh, in the interior living in complex care. And okay. a, nurse, a nurse isn't able to do uh, intermittent catheter, um, but they are allowed, however, to put in an indwelling catheter. Do you know why that would be? I have absolutely no idea. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, because you are in complex care. Uh, I would have to check back with my colleagues in interior health um, to find out why intermittent catheterization cannot be done, especially if I see was the recommended um, approach. 
So I, I, I would have to check back and um, there would need to be a way that I could communicate that. So perhaps after the conversation, um, we can somehow make a connection. Um, uh, Robin, uh, I'm not sure how we're going to do that, but sure, we can, we'll figure it out. And then, and then it can be communicated back to um, to this person. That sounds great. Thank you for that. Okay, we can uh, move it on over to Shelby. Okay, perfect. So hello, guys. Uh, it's lovely to meet you all, uh, even in this virtual world. Um, and thank you, Shelly, for introducing me um, as a refresher. My name is Shelby Payton, and I am um, the consumer care supervisor. So I do work for Coloplast. Um, meaning that if uh, you've ever called into us here at Coloplast before, uh, chances are you have spoke with some of the people on my team. Um, today, I'm going to take a little bit of your time uh, just to talk to you about some of the basics of some of the reimbursement programs in BC. Um, if you have any questions about your own reimbursement status, uh, please definitely don't hesitate to reach out to us uh, in Coloplast Care. Um, we have a bunch of dedicated advisors as well as some reimbursement specialists. Um, and after I finish my slides, I'll make sure to pop our contact info just into the Zoom chat. So feel free to write that down and give us a call. Um, so with that, let's dig in. Uh, Robin, do you wanna flip to the next slide? Perfect. All right, so first things first, uh, what kinds of reimbursement exist? Um, the answer to that is many, um, but each have their own set of eligibility qualifications. The, um, the first and most common two um, are provincial, um, also known as public, uh, and this would include programs like Pharmacare, PWD, um, which stands for Persons with Disabilities, um, and AHP, which is the at-home program, um, as well as private, uh, and this would include um, you know, any private insurances uh, through work or perhaps a third party, uh, for example, like Blue Cross. Um, next are all of the programs like auto insurance, um, workers comp. Um, there's a great program called NIHB, um, which is a program for uh, First Nations or Inuit, uh, as well as veteran affairs. Um, these options have much more rigid requirements uh, for eligibility and, of course, will be based on a case by case. Um, Robin, do you want to flip to my next slide? Perfect. So like I mentioned before, uh, some of the provincial programs include uh, PWD, but I'll go through it, that a little bit more in depth on my next set of slides. Um, for this one, though, I kind of wanted to talk about the at-home program. I'm not sure if it's relevant to anybody here, but uh, it is a great program that I think we often forget about. So the at-home program, also known as AHP, uh, uh, is for, um, it's a program for parents with children uh, who require medical supplies. Uh, and this can include items like catheters uh, as well as our parastine system. Um, AHP essentially provides assistance in two main areas. Uh, the first being a respite benefit, uh, which can be up to $2,800 uh, per year, but that's largely based on income. And the second is medical, uh, which will provide a range of basic um, medically necessary items and services. Uh, and this will need to be settled uh, with what AHP calls an assessor. The role of the assessor, the assessor is basically to qualify you and your eligibility into that program. Um, and there's a number of things that, that the assessor will cover with you, but uh, basically they'll look at your application and decide which of the benefit plans you would qualify for. Um, if you are denied uh, for this program, I would urge you to file an appeal um, at your local AHP lo uh, contact office. Um, in the appeals process, you'll likely be required to provide more uh, medical documentation and probably complete some more forms. Um, but this kind of goes for any public program. I would always urge you to reapply or appeal if you don't get the outcome that you had hoped for. Um, that's often the magic of getting coverage uh, through provincial programs. I've also included some details uh, in this slide uh, for NI NIHB, as well as Veteran Affairs. Um, if you believe that you might qualify for either of these programs, I would urge you to give us a shout uh, at Coloplast and we can help kind of get you started uh, with applying to those programs. Um, some of the eligibility requirements are above, but of course, any questions, don't hesitate to reach out there. 
Uh, Robin, do you want to advance the next one? So uh, for sake of continents and or uh, bowel management supplies, uh, I would love to focus on this program called PWD. So again, that stands for persons with disabilities. Um, and this is the main program available to adults in BC for um, provincial coverage of your chronic care supplies. So according to the PWD website uh, and eligibility page, the main requirements are that you have to be um, 18 or older um, your disability has to be deemed severe um, and expected to last more than two years. Um, as well, it has to directly or significantly affect uh, your ability to perform day-to-day -day activities um, and that you need assistance from either someone or a device. That said, in our experience, we find that the approvals for this program are a little bit more broad um, and the eligibility is much more flexible than the website alludes to. So terms like severity, assistance, disability um, are quite loose in nature. And I would always suggest that you apply to this program, whether you think that you fit into those buckets or not. Um, the worst case scenario is that you hear a no, but the best case is that you get a yes and then you have full coverage of your products. Um, there are lots of ways to apply to PWD. However, if you're already active um, in Pharmacare, then this should make your process much, much faster. Um, the great part of a program like PWD is that you are not assigned a caseworker. Uh, therefore, the process tends to be fairly quick in relation to some of the other programs. Um, Robin, do you want to head forward to my next slide? Oh, oh. Robbie, can I interrupt? Oh, for sorry, is there a question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, there's just a question um, of clarification, sure. I think, by um, Jocelyn. Um, just wondering if you, if, if Colaplast is assisting folks with applying for those pro to those programs for catheter coverage, or um, do you just help them apply for the funding programs? Perfect. Yes, that's, uh, that's a great question. Um, we won't apply on behalf of someone. Um, but we can help kind of first let you know what maybe perhaps you would qualify for, whether that's on the federal, provincial, or private level. Um, a lot of people who have coverage have no idea that they have coverage. Um, and we can kind of help to educate and, and let you know what exists and what you might qualify for. Um, however, it tends to get a lot more in depth than that. So um, for example, I was going to talk about this in a second, but we we can support by looping in or back to your HCP um, and communicating with you about next steps or you know how how to do the reappeal process and um, how to have your HCP rally on on your behalf, um, what forms to submit, things like that. So though we don't apply on your behalf, we can kind of help you hold your hand through the process. Um, and not to mention, you know, it's disheartening when you get a no, especially if you've had a no a couple of times, but ultimately in Coloplast Care, we're kind of there to be your champion and to help you out through that process. So. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, was there any more questions? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so in our experience, I mean, whether you're applying to your private insurance or you're applying to a program like PWD or AHP, it's incredibly common that you're denied after your first application. Um, though I wish this wasn't such a common occurrence, we do hear it time and time again. Um, often, uh, either you'll be completely denied or it'll be approved on a temporary short-term basis. Um, and that's really common with PWD that you'll get approved only for a couple of months at a time. Um, if you find yourself in this situation, again, I strongly urge you to contact our team here at Coloplast because we can help guide you through that process. Um, we find that reapplying uh, with some, some tools or some guidance often gives you a bit of a better outcome. Um, and before I talk about the tools that are on the slide now, I wanted to share with you guys a, a recent story, actually. Um, Galleon, Galleon Bake is our reimbursement specialist. Uh, she's actually on what we call the DTC team here at Coloplast. And she spends the vast majority of her day um, speaking to people who use our products and coaching them through you know, how to apply for coverage. And um, last week, uh, we met a mother who was trying to um, apply on behalf of her daughter who had a spinal cord injury late last year um, to get coverage through PWD. Uh, she wanted her daughter to use both our Peristine system as well as our Speedy Cath Eve catheters. Um, 
And though it took a while, we actually just got confirmation on Thursday that she was fully approved through PWD uh, for both products. So as is the case with many on her first application of PWD, she was outright denied um, and told that she didn't have enough proof, um, enough medical documentation in order to warrant these supplies. So through our team here, we encouraged her to reapply and utilize our letter of recommendation. And with that, uh, she was approved, but on a temporary basis as they required much more medical information in regards to her daughter's condition. So um, where we kind of step in here is that from our office, we actually looped in her HCP and explained the process of what would be required here. Um, the doctor ultimately obliged. And after the third application um, with the additional support from her HCP, she was approved for permanent coverage of our speedy calf. Um, as well as a trial coverage of Peristine uh, with an open-ended contract. So she was able to use the Peristine for three months, fully covered. Um, and if her symptoms showed improvement and it was backed by her HCP, she would be approved for permanent coverage of her Peristine system, um, which is a big win. So even though this is great news, uh, it really does go to show that reapplying can make a world of difference as far as your coverage goes. Um, in a program like PWD, where you aren't assigned a caseworker or an assessor, your approval really um, is based on kind of which advisor you get when you call in and how often you're willing to follow up with your application. It shouldn't be this, this way, but unfortunately it is. Um, my best advice to anyone in trying to apply uh, to this program or any others like it is to advocate for yourself in the applications process. Um, it can take quite a lot of follow-up uh, to keep your case moving forward, uh, but ultimately, you know, we are here to support you in that process. So, um, you know, we can serve as a bit of a calendar reminder, uh, if that's what you'd like from us. Um, it can be as uninvolved as you wish, uh, but um, we can provide you items like our red letter of recommendation or help you navigate, because um, we know that applying to both public and private coverage is it can be a hefty task. Um, it's kind of an overcomplicated system. So um, included on this slide here are some of the tools that you can access by speaking with an advisor here at Coloplast. And we can email them to you, we can mail them to you, whatever is easiest for you. Um, in, my, in my last story, I, re I referenced the letter of recommendation, which is the first image there. Um, since this is formatted similarly to a prescription, it often holds a little bit more weight in the face of reimbursement bodies. Uh, it does require a signature from a healthcare practitioner, uh, which really does hold its key to success. Um, though you can have really any HCP sign off on the sheet, it doesn't need to be a specialist. Um, and when filling it out, just make sure to request the number of items that you require and clearly select the item or items that you, you know, you're trying to apply for coverage for. Um, in the middle there, we also have a concise PDF guide uh, to assist you in accessing coverage in your area. Um, it's a step-by-step -step tool uh, to make things a little bit easier. But uh, of course, if you'd rather chat on the over the phone, uh, we're here to support you there too. Um, lastly, as you saw before, um, are the new Canadian best practice recommendations um, as far as the use of catheters. Um, as has been previously mentioned a few times now, catheters are indeed single use. Um, and despite the new Canadian best practice guidelines, we find that sometimes even if you are approved um, for reimbursement or coverage, it still often does not take that into account. Um, and your approval isn't quite as great as we would hope that it would be. Um, so this information goes a long way in the appeals or reapplication process. Um, and if you're interested in reading them, we can provide you the source here at Coloplast. Um, we've actually had a few people like print the whole thing out and send it in with their forms uh, to their private insurance to be like, here you go. Um, you know, I, I need coverage for, for this many each day. Um, and it, it does go a long way. It's really helpful in that process. Um, all of these tools are essentially available to you in an effort to build your case when it comes to your reimbursement or funding. Um, and again, however you can loop us in, if you choose to, uh, we, are, we are there to support you and make the process as seamless as possible. Um, Robin, do you wanna head to my last slide? Perfect. So um, again, though the team um, is there to support you in your reimbursement and funding, uh, it's small but mighty. Uh, as I mentioned her name before, Galleon uh, is our dedicated specialist here. Uh, she speaks to 
clinicians, uh, people who use our products and vendors uh, to assist in finding the best reimbursement solutions available. Though not everyone can qualify for every program, um, our goal is to assist you in exploring your options. Um, again, if you prefer not to call, you can always access our website for some key information. Um, and we're available by email as well. Um, you're also welcome to sign up for our care program <laughs> and we can send you some updates uh, that might be relevant to you in your situation. Um, I'm hoping that this sheds some light on what is otherwise a really complicated process. Um, if you have any questions about your own situation or you feel you know, you're stuck or you're struggling to get any reimbursement or funding, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We are available in the office. Um, we're located just outside of Toronto. So our time change is a little bit different if you're in BC, um, but ultimately leave us a voicemail and we'll get back to you. Um, I'll share our phone number and email contacts in the Zoom chat um, and feel free to reach out. I think I saw another question pop up um, in the slide. Yeah. So if that one's for me, I definitely don't mind taking it. There's a couple actually. Um... Bert uh, from our information services was wondering for those who have no funding and have a fi and have financial constraints uh, that have to reuse the single use catheters, how many times can they reuse the catheters before they break down? I don't know if anyone... that is a great question, <laughs> um, but I cannot tell you to reuse your catheters. Um, as we're from the manufacturer, uh, we do say that they're a one time use item. I know that there are people who reuse their catheters and I know um, the funding isn't great um, in Canada and it can be hard to access, but I just, we can't tell you uh, to reuse them. Yeah, and um, if I, if you don't mind, I'll jump in there too. The, um, it depends on the type of material that they're made out of as well. And honestly, um, if there is, if they're noted as a single use, as opposed to a multiple use catheter, the multiple use catheters that are out there will have, um, the number of times they can be reused. Um, but again, you always have to look uh, about the benefits versus the, um, the dangers the, of even using the multiple use ones and that top of the list tends to be infection. And if you get infections over and over and you irritate that um, the passage over and over again, you get into meatal stenosis, you get into um, a lot of other things that may require surgery. So it, it, it really is very tough. And that's why uh, we highly recommend um, that you look towards what the resources are and Cold Plus is, a, is great for this in supporting you to navigate the system and support you to look at how best you can acquire what you need on a personal basis. So um, I hope that answers your question, Bert. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. Um... That uh, knowing that single use is the, the best practice and that lots of people are at a financial disadvantage brings us to the next question. Is Colaplus speaking to provincial medical services uh, policymakers about the importance of single use coverage? So I can take that one. And uh, the short answer is yes. So um, really excitingly on our side, we were able to bring on uh, a new person uh, earlier this year who um, their whole role is going to be about uh, advocating for funding for all of our products across the country. Um, we've been really, really in, uh, sorry, really, really involved and worked really closely with Spinal Cord Injury Ontario on their um, recent advocacy project, which has um, gone on for uh, over two years now, actually, um, and has created a lot of momentum and a lot of learnings and kind of best practices uh, that we are now um, going to work with this person on our team, as well as with uh, uh, patient support groups like SCIBC across the country to kind of expand the project further. Um, so it's definitely that we haven't had um, meetings directly with the BC government yet. Uh, I can tell you that it's, it's definitely on our radar because we strongly feel that all of the people across Canada who rely on intermittent catheters uh, to drain their bladder should have access to them. Thanks for that, Robin. Yeah. Um, 
does anybody else have any questions or? Yeah, I, Shelley, uh, it's Jim Hargrave uh, in the Fraser Valley and maybe a question for Marcy if I might. Go for it. Uh, Marcy, I'm a C5 inflammation in my neck problem. So I have very limited finger use. I have a Vancouver-based urologist who has told me that uh, within seven years of my sickness, uh, he wants me out of indwelling and into uh, single use, intermittent calf. And out here in the valley, I'm in the Abbotsford area, I have found it very difficult to get any nurses outside of Vancouver and GF Strong uh, home care, no, we don't have anybody who does it. No suggestions. I'll talk to a boss. With COVID, nothing's happening that's extended. Okay, services. I yeah, I can. On and on and on. I can give you. Um, there is a nurse cons advisor. Uh, actually, two of them out of Abbotsford Hospital Urology Clinic. Okay. So I... get your um, family physician to do a direct referral or your urologist to do a direct referral to um, the urology clinic at Abbotsford Hospital. The uh, folks at Blue Sun had guided me there in my last visit. Uh, am I going to get any kind of uh, home support in that in terms of you know, finger use and all those sorts of things or is that something I'm gonna have to look to GF Strong for? Well, GF Strong still remain the they are the experts in at adaptive um, devices that will uh, assist you in using um, uh, of doing intermittent catheterization. So uh, I would, if it is strictly to learn how to do it, uh, and then um, as you progress and you are finding it more difficult, GF Strong their OTs are absolutely amazing in terms of the way that they are able to show you how to adapt. And uh, Colopast would probably be happy to have me ask why I should be moving off of an indwelling after seven years of indwelling without problems. Uh, what's the medical reason why I should be looking and nurses recommending single use intermittent? Are, are you asking me? Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Because in dwelling, how many uh, urinary tract infections have you had? Symptomatic. One serious one. Yeah. Uh, so ultimately, the longer um, whoever is managing your catheter changes too must be um, managing them quite well, uh, your indwelling by the same token, there is a higher incidence of um, erosion, there's a higher incidence of bladder calculi, there's a higher incidence of um, infection. And so intermittent catheterization, clean intermittent catheterization is the, uh, the gold standard um, if you're able to do it. And certainly stay on top of the timing because each person has their own schedule that they would be um, coached on and assessed on in order to determine when to catheterize. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Jim. There's a, a couple of comment. There's a comment in the chat for you as well. Um, you can check that out. And Robin, I think the link that you sent for the uh, best practice report was in French. Um, I'm wondering if you can pop the link in for the English version, although we are a bilingual country. There we go. I just added it in. Sorry about that. <laughs> so we are right up against 7.30. I want to respect people's times, but uh, time, but does anybody have any, any further questions or comments or, or examples of successfully advocating for themselves. If not, we can um, thank these lovely folks for staying up late and, uh, and bringing their expertise. Um, thanks everyone. That was a really informative presentation. Marcia, thanks for 
um, showing us a bit about how you guys came up with the, the guidelines and, um, and sharing your expertise with us. Um, I'm sure everyone's gonna go home and read those guidelines now, right guys? All, whatever it was, 75 pages of them. And, um, and Robin and Shelby, thanks for sharing your expertise um, and, uh, and your tips on advocacy. And I would just um, leave everyone with a, a reminder or a, a, a note to um, just really always do uh, try to advocate for yourselves. You never know when you're gonna come across the right healthcare um, champion for you who's gonna help you get the best care that you need. And that's why uh, we're all here. So thanks very much everyone. And we'll see you around. Thanks. And Shelly, can I just um, get you to email me so that I can communicate with you uh, in order to answer the question for uh, related to complex care? Yes, will do. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, good night, everyone. Okay, good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, guys. Thanks for having us. Have a great night.